And again, I'm reading from the book of Acts, chapter 2, beginning at verse 41. Those who believed what Peter said were baptized and added to the church that day, about 3,000 in all. All the believers devoted themselves to the apostles' teaching and to fellowship and to sharing in meals, including the Lord's Supper, and to prayer. A deep sense of awe came over them all, and the apostles performed many miraculous signs and wonders. And all the believers met together in one place and shared everything they had. They sold their property and possessions and shared the money with those in need. They worshiped together at the temple each day met in homes for the Lord's Supper and shared their meals with great joy and generosity, all the while praising God and enjoying the goodwill of all the people. And each day the Lord added to their fellowship those who were being saved. This is the word of God for the people of God. Thanks be to God. Good morning, church. I don't know about you, but I think most of my childhood and even into my teen years, uh, any exposure I had to community outside of family and school and church probably came through the TV. And my guess is that a lot of you knew same of the same, some of the same communities that I did. So I'm gonna test my hypothesis this morning by giving you the first few words of a familiar TV show's theme song, and you tell me the name of the show. Are you ready? They're creepy and they're kooky, mysterious and spooky. They're all together ooky. The Adams Family, right. This one may be a little more difficult. Well, now take down your fishing pole and meet me at the fishing hole. We may not get a bite all day, but don't you rush away. If you're struggling with that one, you would probably get it if I whistled the tune for you, because that's what you're used to hearing. Yeah, the Andy Griffith Show. Farm living is the life for me. Land spreading out so far and wide. Keep Manhattan, just give me that countryside. Green Acres. Uh, boy, the way Glenn Miller played. Songs that made the hit parade. Guys like us, we had it made. Those were the days. All in the family, yes. Making your world in, your way in the world today takes everything you've got. Taking a break from all your worries sure would help a lot. Wouldn't you like to get away? Sometimes you want to go where everybody knows your name. Cheers. Oh, this one's, this one's a, a give me. Just sit right back and you'll hear a tale, a tale of a fateful trip that started from this tropic port aboard this tiny ship. Yeah, Gilligan's Island. Uh, even though Gilligan's Island first aired when I was five years old, by the time I was watching it, it was in reruns. I, I remember my brothers and sisters and I would sit and watch the adventures of this unfortunate group who never intended to be a community. All they wanted was a four or a three hour tour together. Uh, part of what made the show so funny was the unique and different personalities of each of the castaways. Remember the skipper? He was smart and fearless, knew how to take charge and lead the group. And then there were the Howells, that filthy rich couple, and they knew how to handle anything that required a knack for business and administration. Marianne was the comforter and encourager, always ready with a coconut pie for whoever was feeling down. Uh, and the professor, man, he was better than MacGyver. With one of his incredible inventions, he could figure out a way to fix any problem, except the fact that they were stuck on this island. 
And Ginger, she could act. And, and because of that, she could get them out of whatever jam they were in with whomever was visiting the island at the time. But the real star of the show was Gilligan. He was the one with a servant's heart. He would do anything for anyone and usually mess it up. But even when he messed things up, his heart was always in the right place. In his own selfless way, Gilligan loved everyone in their thrown together community. I, I still think Gilligan's Island is a great show. Uh, behind the comedy, there are great lessons to be learned in every episode. It's also a great picture of a community. They survived because each complemented one another's strengths. They worked together and because of that, they were able to handle whatever challenge each new episode brought. Each week, without knowing it at the time, I was watching authentic community being lived out. In this community, everyone knew they belonged. They knew that they had something to contribute to the community. In this community, they were all important. Each one of them had a sense of belonging. They were confident that their gifts and talents were important. They each felt that sense of support that the others provided. Their lives were woven together. In one episode, Gilligan got upset. He felt unloved, and so he moved out all on his own into a cave on the other side of the island. He quickly realized that he couldn't thrive without the support of the others. He'd lost a major benefit that comes through community, that sense of wholeness, of completeness. He knew that he needed the rest of the group and that together, they could accomplish things that he could never do alone. It's a picture of community, a group of people maintaining their individuality and uniqueness, but coming together as one to live life together and move toward one goal, in their case, to get off the island, in our case, to advance the kingdom of God here on earth. We gotta learn a lot from this group. This is the kind of community and togetherness that we see in the early church, and, and this is what we can see in this place. But how does it begin? Last week, we looked at three definitions of community. This week, I want to add another definition. A community is a unified body of individuals with common character and common interests who share joint ownership and participation in something. The early church fits this definition, but what was it that really made the early church into a community? In verse 42 of today's text, we read that they joined with the other believers and devoted themselves to the apostles' teaching and fellowship, sharing in the Lord's Supper and in prayer. So a key piece is they devoted themselves Literally, they continued steadfastly. They committed themselves. The complete English version says they were like family together. Uh, the Greek word translated as continually devoted means to attend constantly, continue steadfastly, wait on or to carry on strongly. In other words, this was not a one-time commitment or a religious duty. They committed themselves totally to the fellowship as a lifestyle. The early church understood this. They did things together and their lives were intertwined and connected with each other. The devotion of these early Christians was not just an emotional attachment. It was a devotion that was authenticated by the strength of their commitment to one another. The steadfast commitment they displayed toward one another caused the rest of the world to sit up and take notice. Look at the description in verse 44. All the believers met together constantly and shared everything they had. 
The Greek word fellowship means to share something in common. The rest of the passage fleshes out this concept for us. Verse 44 says they were all together. Verse 46 tells us that they met together in the temple courts and they ate together. In fact, our text for today tells us three times that they ate together. Shared meals played an important role in the life of the early church. They seem to follow that North American maxim that didn't even exist yet. Feed them and they will come. So here's this early community that becomes a standard of what authentic community is like. But what set this community apart from all the others? What made it so authentic? Well, it starts with the fact that they shared whatever they had. The New International Version translates verse 44 as all the believers were together and had everything in common. What they had in common? Everything. Understand, they were not clones. There was tremendous diversity among that group. This isn't that small band of 120 believers who were present at the temple on Pentecost. It might have started in the morning with them, but by the end of the day, they numbered 3,120. And if you read the whole of Acts 2, you'll discover that the group of people that were saved that day and became the early church were made up of people from all over the known world. They each brought their own personalities and gifts and their uniqueness. But at the core, at the center of it all, there was common ground. Like that first group of Jesus followers, our own church is made up of very unique individuals and becoming a community doesn't mean that we have to lose that. We need your unique gifts and talents. We need your unique perspectives and viewpoints, your personality quirks and your sense of humor. Your individuality will make us what we are as a ministry. But when when we have so many different types of people spanning the generations, there's always the potential for conflict. The early church was unified, but as you read through Paul's letters and the rest of the New Testament, you see that conflict begins to rear its ugly head. It's just human nature. In a church that is not a community, conflict will tear apart. This is is where you see church splits and some of that ugly stuff that so many churches are known for. But the church that works through that and has developed community is one who is able to concentrate on what we have in common instead of what their differences are. When we begin from a common ground, we can work through the problems and the conflicts. Well, I believe with all of my heart that you and I were created for community. That's why our focus this morning is so important. You were made to have intimate relationships, to serve people lavishly, to share the stuff that you have, to build into the lives of the people around you, to have people to whom you can entrust the secrets of your heart, people that you can laugh with, praise with, pray with, and cry with. We need other human beings in our lives. But here's a weird truth about us human beings. While we long for community, we also run from it. It's been said that when humankind fell from grace, we inherited not only a tendency to hide from God, but a tendency to hide from one another as well. We struggle with conflicting desires. On the one hand, we desire to be close to one another, and on the other, we want to hold others at arm's length. We've learned to be suspicious of other people's motives. 
At times we've been taken advantage of and we fear being burned again and so we erect barriers. And these barriers effectively insulate us from one another. They become an impediment to true community in the church. In the Gospel of John, chapter 17, verses 22 through 23, Jesus prayed that we might be one, even as he and the Father are one. I want you to listen to what he prayed for us. I have given them the glory you gave me so that they may be one as we are one. I am in them and you are in me. May they experience such perfect unity that the world will know that you sent me and that you love them as much as you love me. But for that to happen, some walls have to fall down. Suspicion has to be replaced with openness. Uncertainty has to be replaced with willingness. And fear has to be replaced with love. On the day of Pentecost, that's exactly what happened. The barriers came down. And the Holy Spirit of God moved in and produced a wonderful unity in that first group of believers. Our text for today describes the extent of that unity as it existed at the very beginning. And for a while, they were allowed to live in the glorious oneness which only the Spirit can produce. I believe this sense of community can be recaptured today when we allow Christ to be Lord. When we surrender ourselves to the leading of the Holy Spirit in our personal lives. And I believe that deep down within us, we all long to be close, to be part of the same family, to be in tune and in touch with one another. Let's pray. Loving God, I believe that you created us with a heart need to love one another. Uh, we need to love others and we need to be loved by others. It's, it's a reflection of another need that we have, the need to love you and be loved by you. And we best reflect you in this world when we are loving those in the world around us. It doesn't mean we always have to agree on everything. But it means that even in spite of disagreement, we never stop loving. And it means that we are committed to that. That no matter how hard it gets, we're going to be committed to the community relationship. The relationship in this congregation. The relationship that we have in community outside of the doors of this church. And Lord, I pray that the community experienced in this place, in this congregation, will be so authentic that those living around us in the neighborhoods surrounding this church, those folks will take notice and hunger for that kind of relationship and community themselves. Lord, use us to make yourself known. I pray it will be so. In Jesus' name, amen.
I send you out of this time of worship to be the people of God in the church of Jesus Christ you were created and called to be. Uh, those who are living in authentic community, maybe such a radically different community that those around you take notice and want to share in that same kind of belonging. I pray that kind of relationship will be demonstrated in every aspect of your living and your being and your doing. In Jesus' name, amen.